All right, uh, maybe we can begin. Uh, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in this webinar on unpaid wages and remittances, deconstructing the impact of COVID-19 and ways forward. Uh, before, I, before we start the webinar, I would like to invite uh, uh, Bettina Etter from the Swiss Development Corporation to give the opening words, opening remarks. Bettina? Thank you, William. I hope you can all see and hear me fine. Um, great. So good afternoon from Switzerland, but good morning or good evening, wherever you are situated in the world. Um, welcome to this webinar that um, Migrant Forum Asia, Switzerland and the UK as the colleagues of the Call to Action are partnering on. Um, this webinar will explore how the lifeline of remittances is affected, affected during this current pandemic um, by the widespread malpractice, let's call it by, by the name of unpaid or cut down wages of many migrant workers. Um, let me quickly situate the call to action. Switzerland and UK have launched it, what purpose it serves even though most of you will have heard about it by now, but still to set the scene, um, allow me to um, present the call to action briefly. So um, you all know back in April, the World Bank released quite alarming estimates about the expected drop in remittances of about 20% or around 110 billion US dollars. This um, fact or this, this estimate, um, this news prompted Switzerland and the UK together with a number of institutional partners to raise awareness about the potentially devastating effect of this decline um, for millions of people around the world who rely on the vital lifeline of remittances. Um, now, by the end of October, um, new trend releases from the World Bank come timely in clarifying um, the trends and numbers as anecdotal evidence from the past month has suggested the World Bank basically confirms that the drop in remittances will not be as sharp as expected this year, yet there will be a more gradual fall extending into 21. So by the end of um, 2021, there's going to be a fall by about 14% compared to the pre-COVID-19 levels in 2019. So while remittances to some regions and countries have been quite resilient to the economic crisis, and in some cases even reached un unprecedented monthly peaks um, for various reasons that I won't go into now. There is no sign of immediate relief yet as some countries and regions are hit hard by the dwindling remittances. So the new data by the World Bank confirms a differentiated picture of remittances and provides key points of reference to understand what measures um, by private and public sector have possibly helped stabilize remittances and identify what additional action may be required to keep remittances flowing during um, the crisis. So um, while the outlook for remittances remains uncertain and will depend on the impact of or the continuing impact of COVID-19 on global growth altogether, um, we feel the call to action um, launched in May still keeps its, its relevant um, relevance to date. So the call to action continues to provide a platform for governments and other constituencies in sharing experiences, exploring solutions and taking concerted action. Um, as you know, the call to action doesn't identify and promote key measures that can be taken by policymakers, regulators and remittance service providers to ensure um, that services um, is sustained during, during the crisis and potentially new channels, um, especially also looking to the potential digitization can be um, introduced and, and leveraged. So um, we've all, he all heard about some of the measures, some are more easy to take, some, some may be a bit more complicated, but um, declaring remittance services as essential temporarily waiving or reducing transfer fees, promoting digital solutions, 
and providing um, regulatory relief for remittance service providers can help um, prevent millions of people from falling into poverty or deeper into poverty, um, which we all know would negatively impact the achievement of the SDGs as it has been established um, for a long time already with the recognition in the 2030 agenda and the Addis Ababa action agenda that um, the contribution of migrants through remittances is um, an enormous potential in terms of achieving the sustainable development goals. So um, we are very pleased that Migrant Forum Asia has decided to join the call to action and um, enriches the coalition with their highly valuable perspective. In our view, civil society is the seismograph, if you will, of the international community providing real-time information based on human stories on the ground that should be considered in policy making to ensure that any measures taken are in fact migrant responsive. So we very much look forward to today's webinar that addresses how a steady flow of remittances can be maintained by ensuring that migrant workers are compensated for their work in countries of destination. Additionally, the webinar will also explore um, what could be some of the ways forward of ensuring access to justice and compensation as a strategy to facilitate, facilitate expedited remittances to families that strongly rely on this vital lifeline. So with this welcome on behalf of Switzerland and the UK, um, the co-leads of the call to action and all of our institutional partners again to this webinar. And um, thank you, William, for um, proposing this, this timely event that we're happy to partner on with you. So I give it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina, for that uh, very uh, well pointed uh, intro introduction in which uh, I think you have raised some very key points with regard to remittances and their impact both on, on migrants and their families and in relation to achieving and in relation to achieving the SDG goals. Uh, and I'm sure as we continue in, in this webinar, a lot of this will be brought out in terms of uh, what, what are the implications, even as now we talk of the, the vaccine and we look forward uh, to 2021 being a year of at least a lot more hope than 2020. Uh, what hope is there really for migrant workers, particularly those who have already been repatriated or those who are still in, stranded in countries of, of uh, uh, destination, uh, seeking alternatives to the employment that they have lost. So let, let us let us begin this this webinar then, and and see how to go deeper into this issue. And for that, we've got a very good panel uh, today, and I will introduce the panel straight off so that we can uh, we can go in, into we can go into the discussion. Uh, as we as we continue. So let me start within the order of the panelists that I will call upon. Uh, I've, uh, the first panelist uh, on the, uh, that we will call upon is uh, Dilip Pratha. And Dilip Pratha is the lead economist uh, for migration and remittances and head of NOMAD. He acts as a focal point for the World Bank on migration and remittances and diaspora bonds. He is also a coordinator. He is also the coordinator of the G7 G20 Global Remittances Working Group. Uh, Dilip has done a lot of work uh, on remittances, and one statement captures it all. In 2008, a New York Times article about his life and work stated that no one has done more than Dilip Ratha to make migration and its potential rewards a top of the agenda concern in the world's development ministries. Uh, Dilip is also editor of People Move a Blog. Uh, he's well known to many of us, and he has he has raised very pertinent questions and concerns with regard to the current situation and its impact on my, uh, on on uh, on the development agenda. Our next panelist will be Miss Ellen Sana, who is the executive director of Center for Migrant Advocacy. Ellen is known for her frontline advocacy work that she has done, not only in the Philippines, but at the regional and global level. She's a strong feminist and a migrant rights activist. She has been engaged at policy level I, I, and in her own country, but also in many of the regional processes that are engaged in migration. Uh, 
uh, that are that are that are engaged in migration in our region. Uh, her, she has also been uh, the former chair of uh, Migrant Forum Asia. So it's good to see her uh, on this panel today. Our third panelist is Ray Jurindini. And Ray Jurindini is a professor of migration ethics and human rights at the Center for Islamic Legislation and Ethics in the College of Islamic Studies. Uh, Ray has authored quite a number of books, uh, uh, publications, uh, but one of, what, uh, one of the most significant uh, contributions of Ray's work is that he was one of, he, one of the authors of the Qatar Foundation's 23 mandatory standards for migrant workers' welfare and the author of a 2014 report on migration labor recruitment uh, to Qatar and the Qatar Foundation. Ray has looked at this issue of uh, recruitment and recruitment cost and has made very, uh, very clear recommendations to member states and UN agencies on what could be the way forward. Uh, it's good to have Raya in this in this call today with us. His most recent uh, publication in 2019 was an assessment of the wage protection systems in Qatar. Uh, and our last panelist for the day will be uh, uh, last but not least, Professor Francois Cropot, who many of us know. Uh, he is a full-time professor at the Hans and Tamar Oppenheimer Chair in Public Law, Public International Law at the Faculty of Law of McGill University. Uh, Professor Crapo is a member of the Scientific Committee of the Agency of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. He is also the thematic working group chair on migrant rights and integrations in host communities. But uh, many of us know him as the spe former special rapporteur on, of mig on migrants as well, and have worked very closely with him on, on, some, on, on some of his reports that he has presented uh, to, to the Human Rights Council. Uh, so let me then begin with, uh, with starting, uh, let us begin this. Uh, webinar, and I will start with um, with you, Dilip. Uh, and Bettina, in her introduction, mentioned uh, the whole uh, the SDG goals and how we go about achieving them. And it, it was quite a big achievement moving away from the Millennium Development Goals to the SDG goals, in the sense where in the Millennium Development Goals there was not much recognition of migration, but in the SDG goals you see migration. Uh, configures quite uh, quite well within the SDG goals, and uh, now with COVID and when there are questions about the the development indicators and about reaching these goals and the targets that that were set out, uh, could you say something about how the current crisis and particularly the non-payment of wages? is going to, in some ways, have some impact on the SDGs goals and the targets that have been set. Dilip, the floor is yours. Thank you, William. And thanks to Bettina uh, Aird of us to, uh, in, in the beginning to uh, support this uh, uh, call to action. And uh, uh, it's a great uh, opportunity for all of us to be here to discuss a topic that has direct implications for millions of uh, people. And, probably uh, more than a million, you know, a few hundred million people. We're probably talking about even a billion people if you included internal migration issues. So um, there are three migration related sustainable development goal indicators. Um, one is uh, increasing the volume of remittances. That's actually a part of a means of implementation, how to finance sustainable development goals. In other words, if financing stops, everything else uh, on, on SDGs would stall. So that's important. Uh, and the crisis has impacted the flow of remittances as um, uh, Bettina pointed out in, a, in our report that we released um, recently about um, just about a month ago. Um, we pointed out that remittance flows to low and middle income countries uh, in 2019 were about $550 billion. Depending on how you define the countries, it is just over $550 billion or just under $550 billion. So around $550 billion. At that level, in 2019, remittances surpassed 
foreign direct investment flowing to developing countries, all foreign direct investment. And for a long time, for more than uh, two decades now, remittances have been larger than official development assistance, the total of official development assistance. Indeed, remittances are more than three times the size of official development assistance. So it's a huge uh, force uh, for development and um, uh, it, it is going to slow down because of the COVID-19 crisis by 7.2% in 2020, that's our expectation. And uh, in 2021, again, a further decline of 7.5%. So from 550 billion to just about 470 billion, we are looking at more than a hundred billion dollar drop. That compare that with the total aid volume of about 160 billion. So that's a big, big message. So when financing drops, financing for development drops, that would impact all SDGs including uh, poverty, it would include uh, increased inequality, it would affect education, it would affect health, it would affect supply of water, infrastructure, uh, everything. So that is really worrisome and there is a need to keep remittances flowing. So great to see this call to action actually of, of being, um, being so vocal about it. The second SDG indicator, uh, SDG, um, it, target indicator is uh, uh, the um, goal to uh, the target or whatever, the, the measure to reduce remittance costs to under 3% by 2030. And currently the average cost is uh, just about uh, 7%, 6.8%. Uh, and what we are saying is that between quarter two and quarter three during the crisis, remittance costs actually have gone up, not gone down, they have gone up. So that is, uh, again, a, an area of focus, how to bring down remittance costs and improve banking access for migrant workers. The, uh, the third one is um, worker prepaid recruitment costs. As you know, um, an example I always gave is um, a Bangladeshi worker going to work in a Gulf country as a construction worker is quite likely paying as uh, fees to labor agents all of which is illegal, workers are not supposed to pay, employers are supposed to pay fees for recruitment. The Bangladeshi worker is paying probably 30 months or 40 months, so three years, four years worth of expected wages as upfront labor fees. So that's the beginning of uh, being a modern day slave. And with the crisis, with uh, the uh, fact that employment levels have fallen, employers are having difficulties in many migrant host countries. They are uh, sure to um, put migrants at the end because migrants do have less rights. Uh, they do not have adequate protection. So they are the ones that would take the fall. And there is the cons uh, whole issue of uh, wages not being paid or migrants just um, not being respected in terms of their employment contract. And if they go back, then they lose everything. So there are many issues and uh, that has direct implications for the ability of migrants to help families back home, uh, which has implications for sustainable development goals. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dilip, for that. And, and thank you for pointing that out because, uh, and I like what you're saying and, and what you have kind of pointed out that it's it's more than just not receiving your wages, the impact kind of when you talk about worker paid recruitment cost kind of thing. So it, it, when, when you delve into the issue, it's much more than not getting one month salary or two month salary kind of thing. It, but the implications of migrant workers starts much prior to even kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the situation of the, that the COVID has kind of uh, 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 put them in. And, I, and this is something that we ourselves are discovering in some of the documentation that we are doing now as we've launched this kind of uh, justice for wage theft campaign, which tries to look at this and we, we are 
recognizing the many and different ways in which workers are being deprived of what they paid for in the sense of what you're saying worker recruit worker paid recruitment cost but also being deprived of the of, of this of what they've put into the work then the sweat their energy all the resources kind of thing and the sacrifices and you you take the whole social cost kind of thing that they put into it and all that now in this time of the COVID has come to come upon them in a way that it is it it is really going to have a deep impact in terms of the development trajectory for their own lives and for that of their families and on a broader level their communities because many workers uh, contribute in many ways to the small communities and villages uh, development in 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 that sense as well but through some of the kind of projects they could get involved in so thank you for that and uh, l let me therefore follow up uh, with you just a, a question there then it, it, is that it, when the world bank and I know you have said drop in remittances, and that's why it's good, good that you've spelled that out, because uh, when we start looking, and, and you've said something like a 100 million kind of drop, if we are going to look at, uh, how, how do countries of origin that have been dependent on this kind of remittances, uh, what, how, what kind of... Uh, prospects are there for them when these drop in remittances are is is so acute uh, and some for some where it is much high uh, high by way of gdp kind of thing high portions of their gdp uh, what 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 uh, what prospects are there for them in terms of well getting some of these remittances back or, or getting some of these wages kind of thing. Is the World Bank looking at it from that angle as well? Uh, yes, um, uh, William. The, the drop in remittances would be from somewhere around 548 billion in 2019 to 470 billion by um, 2021. So that's 130 billion almost. 130 billion. And just to put things in perspective, the total amount of development aid going to Africa is in the range of about 35 billion a year. So this is four times the total aid that goes to Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, that's the drop alone, right? And there is no way that aid efforts can be uh, increased because all uh, donor countries or remittance source countries, the the so-called part one countries are having acute uh, fiscal difficulties. So they will not be able to increase aid. And then um, origin countries, especially the poorer ones, smaller ones, the ones that are more fragile, in those countries remittances tend to be one third or sometimes even a half of the national income. Uh, the smaller countries and poorer countries are actually going to be hard pressed to bridge the gap or, or even partially bridge the gap uh, that remittances would create. And that means that uh, countries first have to brace for impact. You know, there is, there is no way around that. Uh, right now, the, the eyes are focused on the ball and the ball is COVID-19, right? Uh, the problem is that something bigger is coming and that is, I think, an important uh, message that we were able to communicate in April with our report that remittances are falling and that we need to do something. And, you know, uh, as you know, uh, World Food Program got the, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, earlier this year. And um, from what I understand, they almost doubled the number of people that are going to be vulnerable to food insecurity after looking at the drop in remittances. So, you can imagine, we are talking about hundreds of millions of people. Um, what can origin countries do and what can uh, host countries do? And I think, uh, uh, you know, a few things that can be done, uh, but one more, most important thing prior to everything else is that don't do anything that cannot be undone when the crisis uh, hopefully is over. That I think is important. And in, in that respect, um, when we are focusing on the money flow, we forget about the people who generate the money flow. Uh, 
the migrants and migrants themselves are suffering if migrants suffer then money will not be generated so first of all we need to take care of migrants so origin countries also have a role to take care of their stranded migrants abroad migrants who know that they don't want to come back because if they come back they may not be able to go back again because the doors are shutting and shutting more and more and more uh, borders are being enforced even more uh, i i heard that uh, in mexico if you want to get a visa to the us now the appointment date is in uh, i think late august late august of 2021 for mexicans to come to the us i mean that sort of uh, entry barriers everywhere is going to make recovery difficult even if there is vaccine uh, it is going to make recovery difficult because if employers are reliant on migrant workers and they have gone back home or they are just not available and they can't come back when you want to open your doors and you want to cook more meals or serve more uh, gross sell more groceries or you know do more construction uh, you won't you won't have that so the eye is right now on the ball and the ball is medical things it services and all that but the other services are being ignored so that is the most important thing in in my view and then recognizing remittances as essential services um making sure that migrants are included in our healthcare responses migrants families back home ought to be included in policy responses as well uh, that is important and on remittances i think uh, one of the long lasting policy measures that origin countries as well as host countries could work on is increasing access to banking for migrant workers migrant workers families back home and uh, then money transfer companies access to banking as well money transfer companies especially the ones that do digital remittances they often have not often almost without exception have difficulty getting uh, a bank account because banks don't want to take the risk of working with new players startups and that has to be uh, addressed so origin countries can do a lot but they also have to campaign with uh, uh, host countries so that access to banking access to digital services remittance services financial services in general would be improved uh, thank you thank you thank you dilip for that and and uh, again it's nice that the focus should be on the migrant worker that don't don't do anything like you said look after the migrant worker because if the migrant worker is suffering then that is going to have a bigger implication in terms of remittances flows and the role of the country of origin i think it's high time that countries of origin also that are highly dependent on migration uh, out uh, labor migration kind of thing uh, i i think it's high time that they they started looking at what opportunities they can create in terms of caring for their workers uh, who are returning and and what is the sustainability programs that they could put in place for them as well uh, thank you and and le- let me then move on to uh, and I, as before i come back to you again let me move on to ellen sana and uh, ellen uh, you are from the philippines and uh, philippines is one of the countries that um, uh that is uh, has a very big uh, li- li- uh, migrant population and highly dependent in some ways on remittances as well uh, what what are you seeing in this t- time of covid and how has it uh, impacted uh, m- uh, filipino migrant workers and particularly women migrant workers if you could if you could say something about that helen thank you Thank you William and uh, greetings to everyone. I actually prepared uh, my statement for the first round of intervention so if I may I I will read it. Uh, so I will start. Filipino labor migration has been around for more than 45 years now with an annual deployment of almost 2 million uh, Filipinos since 2016. 
Majority of our migrant workers are in low-wage occupations, thus their families are left behind in the Philippines. With this situation of dependency, as you said, the migrant workers would think hard before they will file complaints of underpayment or non-payment of wages lest they get deported because remittances is uh, staying in the country of destination is key to keeping the remittances flowing. Okay, so until the COVID-19 pandemic struck and migrant workers in tens of thousands who did not have support systems and social protections in countries of destination had to reluctantly leave for home. A significant number of repatriated migrants did not receive their full wages and other benefits or did not receive anything at all. Pre-COVID times, we call this non-payment or underpayment of wages during this COVID-19 pandemic. As Bettina said, we are calling it for what it is, massive wage theft. What can be done? For those, and this is the context of the Philippines, for those who have returned, like in the Philippines, we have a law that provides for joint and several liability between the local recruiter and the foreign employer. And thus, those with the recruitment agencies can file money claims in the Philippines, not only for unpaid or underpaid uh, wages, but for other damages, as mentioned by Dilip, uh, that would, could include excessive fee collection, moral damages even. But under COVID times, however, the recruiters may challenge this provision to argue that this is forced, mature, or unexpected, and they would not uh, easily agree to, to paying the, for the financial obligations of the employers. And thus, there is no certainty that the repatriated workers will be able to get their unpaid wages. And this is only one country we are talking about. For others who have returned to the country, what they did was to leave an authorization letter to our mission allowing them to receive the, the wages, the unpaid wages, once the employers are able to, to pay it back. Yeah, but then again, that's that's long shot. Number two, for those who remain in the countries of destination while awaiting repatriation, they can file complaints with the mission or where mechanisms like the wage protection system exist, like in the UAE, Qatar, and even Saudi Arabia. And that's what I would like to listen also to what uh, Ray would have to say on this wage protection system. The workers can try to file, but this may be easier said than done, particularly for workers employed by small companies and of course, including migrant domestic workers. This may be quite difficult. So what else can be done? In a situation where affected population is big and where action must be swift, governments must step in and intervene as duty bearers, but also as regulators. They are in the best position to find solutions to the issue of wage theft. The countries of origin can provide the data and information on their repatriated migrants and civil society and other stakeholders can assist in doing this documentation requirement. Whereas the countries of destination for their part can match the list of these migrants from the list of employ employers that they have on record in the country of destination. The other parties uh, outside of the governments can also come in and facilitate the process of arriving at a solution where justice will be served on the repatriated migrants and other migrants on site. And thus this campaign that uh, we have uh, for, for justice for wage theft. And then we have additional proposals as a gesture of goodwill and solidarity for the great contribution of migrants to development in, of the countries of origin and destination. We propose the creation, I'm, I'm, why can't we, can we consider this? This is not to compensate for the wage theft, but probably the creation of a solidarity fund to be utilized for reintegration programs. Contributions to the funds can be from the countries of destination, private entities, employers, and companies too. Another proposal is a debt swap arrangements. I'd, I'd like to hear Dilip's uh, opinion on this. Debt swap arrangements between credit or countries of destination and debt or countries of origin, where the latter will allocate debt repayment funds for reintegration program for repatriated migrants. In the case of the Philippines, a significant percentage percentage of our national budget for 2021 uh, at about 12.4% of our budget is reserved for debt repayment, 
we can add this amount instead to the reintegration funds that is very much needed at this time. Finally, just a historical footnote to share. In 1976 and 1982, just as we were starting the labor migration program, the government issued directives to make remittances mandatory to migrant workers. Failure to do so will result to disqualification from the labor migration program and denial of renewal of passports. The intent was purportedly to ensure financial support to migrant families left behind. The government at the time was running a huge balance of payments, deficits, and needed the dollars desperately for our export-oriented economy. And thus, we suspected that these directives are really meant for that purpose than you know, for the benefit of the family. And very interestingly, on both occasions, at risk of being penalized, the migrants and their families actually rejected the directives. In the final analysis, the only thing that can make migrants remit their money home are their families that they must leave behind to the relief of the countries of destination. They are the most effective guarantors of remittances. As we make our way out of this COVID-19 pandemic, is it not only fair and just that we give back to the migrants and their families, especially in these times of need? So that's my first round of intervention, William. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ellen. And uh, let me just ask you a very quick question. And if you give a quick response to that, uh, you you have, of course, pointed out uh, uh, the again, uh, and and I hope. Uh, I hope we'll hear Dilip pick that point that you raised with regard to debt swap and compensation solidarity fund. It would be good to get, get a perspective on that. But uh, also that, uh, yes, rem and you've touched upon how remittances is something that is, and I like what you've said, it is uh, migrants in the first place in countries of origin are those left behind. and then they become in their own country they are those left behind and then they become migrants to somewhere hope to catch up kind of thing and and therefore that remittances uh, becomes so important for them and their families but let me just ask you a, a different question and that is uh, the philippines uh, and just to get a perspective on this because you've talked about the repatriation the philippines is involved in a lot of bilateral kind of agreements it has it has championed bilateral agreements more than any other country in this region uh, has that been helpful at this time in drawing attention to the number of Filipino workers who are returning without wages and end of service benefits and how to secure it from host countries? Have those bilateral agreements been any help? I would say that pre-COVID, they have been like the, the good relations we have with countries of destination facilitate a lot of things. For example, during amnesty period, the, the Kuwait or Saudi would agree to cover the, the, the repatriation of uh, many of our undocumented migrants. So I would say that there is value to it. But it's just that at this point in time, I think uh, I'm not uh, very, I don't hear a lot in terms of how countries of destination are contributing in terms of alleviating the situation of migrant workers, except that in terms of their policies as destination countries, and this applies to all, not only like to Filipino migrant workers, where if you have, uh, uh, if you are ill or COVID related uh, 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 situations, they are saying that they would step in and, and, and assist the migrants, uh, no, regardless of nationality or even regardless of status, but not particularly like for the, for the Filipinos. But I would like to think that they, they, there's, there's, there could be uh, advantages to it. But what I'm not seeing perhaps is the press vis-a-vis -vis the countries of destination at this point in time. So I think this is the time when we should be all the more aggressive, especially because, of course, our, op our, our posts, our missions have very limited staff. And from time to time, they also have to shut down their offices because they are also affected by the COVID. This is the time when we should be taking to task as well the countries of destination, you know, expressing goodwill and really getting into concrete uh, programs to assist our migrant workers, but I'm not seeing it, but I think probably it's also like, because we're not 
pushing it as hard or harder than than we should be, especially at this time when you, we are confronted with the crisis. All right. Uh, and, and I think that is an important point that you make as well. I mean, it might be worth thinking if countries of origin and countries of uh, destination, particularly where there are uh, existing practices like regional uh, processes, uh, kind of thing like uh, that exist. Maybe these could be spaces to look at, uh, to take up how to take up this issue and how to come to some kind of uh, arrangement. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is not a triple win. Uh, this is a win for a, 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 this is in so many ways a loss and a loss where it hurts most and that is migrants and their families. But let me come to Ray then now. Uh, and uh, Ray, uh, Ellen has said uh, that before we used to call this uh, non-payment of wages. Now we are calling it for what it is, uh, wage theft. And you yourself have uh, looked at these issues quite extensively in terms of even like what uh, Dilip said of how wage theft is, is more than just non-payment of wages. It's also recruitment, paid cost, and things like that. Uh, wh how, how do you see this issue that, uh, that has become so significant now in this time of, of the COVID. Ray, the floor is yours. Thank you, William. And thank you very much for the organizers uh, for inviting me to this forum. Yes, I mean, um, I went, it was actually, when, when you mounted the campaign of action on wage theft, I, I uh, supported it very much and I thought about it a lot um, and I think we should continue to use this term wage theft or wage fraud, if you like, if it, that's a bit softer, perhaps. Um, and that, you know, this should be criminalized. I mean, the idea of theft or fraud are criminal terms, and that's what I would like to see develop. Um, th this is important, and why, why I'm saying this is because there are, as, as you know, organizations that do not want to use these terms. And naturally employers will be uh, very much opposed to this term, these terms because of the criminalization issue. And, but nonetheless, there's a the whole spectrum uh, of wage theft that includes non-payment of wages, underpayment. And I would also include um, delayed payment because there are consequences for delayed payment for migrant workers uh, in terms of remittances and so on and so forth. There are costs to them of delayed payments. Um, and, you know, in, in the Gulf, for example, I think that, that this is a, an issue that um, hits home to Islamic ethics also. The idea that a timely payment is extremely important in Islam uh, there is the, the, the hadith that says um, that a worker or an employee should be paid before the sweat of his brow dries, uh, a very powerful uh, image. Um, and also there are um, verses that um, implore everybody to be paid what they are owed, not just paid on time, but paid what they are owed. So um, in addition to wages, of course, there's, there's issues about non-payment, delayed payment and underpayment of overtime. Uh, overtime is often played with by employers. Similarly with food allowances, accommodation and transport allowances. These are also income and, and uh, living expenses that, um, that migrant workers get uh, in the Gulf. Um, and again, we know that employers play around with these, um, these rights, financial rights of workers uh, that's in their contracts, but often they don't, don't get it. Um, and I'll come, I will come to the uh, issue of the wage protection system in a moment. But this is, let's just again emphasize the issue of wage theft. In my view, um, an employer who does not pay wages is no different in effect 
than stealing from an, the employee's wallet or, or purse, right? It is theft. In Australia now, the category of wage theft has been applied to the underpayment of wages with criminal penalties of up to four years in jail and $5.5 million in fines. Compare this to Qatar, where the penalty for the breach of timely payment is not more than one month in prison and a fine of not less than 2,000 or 6,000 reals. That's between 550 and 1,650 uh, US dollars. So the penalties for this are an important element to look at with regard to whether they are a deterrent or not. Employers do their calculations. If they, if they have to go to court and they have to pay a fine, if the fine is small, they'll do their calculations to where they will make a profit. Now, of course, wage theft has been an issue long before the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but made more acute now. In the construction industry, for example, the deliberate non-payment of you know, two companies, subcontract contractors and subcontractors, um, is well known deliberate non-payment to force them into bankruptcy so that you don't have to pay them uh, at all. Uh, this results in employers not being able to pay employees. COVID-19 restrictions have sapped the reserves of many businesses that employ migrant workers and they may never recover. Thus, enterprise failure is an important factor in accounting for the decline in jobs, wages and remittances. Um, if you want me to stop, I can stop here or I can go on to, to, to talk about wage cuts and then I can talk later on about the wage protection system. What would you like me to do? Uh, can you talk about wage cuts? Sure. Um, the, we really do need to make a distinction between underpayment and wage cuts, uh, particularly where governments, uh, at least in the GCC that I know, I know best, uh, have legitimated wage cuts. In other words, they have uh, legitimated um, uh, wage cuts, forced leave without pay, uh, job losses for companies that are affected by the pandemic closures. Thus, the increase in precarious jobs has increased as a result. Um, uh, but there have been in, in the GCC, for example, there have been different government policies in terms of uh, wage cuts. Um, all of them have seen the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to push nationalization policies to increase the nationals in the private sector and to reduce dependency upon uh, migrant labor. This is a long-standing uh, wish list, but of course we know that that can only be very limited. But uh, the responses to job reduction and wage cuts of non-nationals has been quite mixed. In the UAE, uh, the UAE allowed um, temporary and permanent salary reductions up to 35% if affected by the COVID, but not in the case of UAE citizens. Um, uh, they allowed employers to cut workers who are on leave, force them to go on leave without pay and so on. Uh, Qatar uh, um, instructed that uh, all government ministries and any, any enterprises that are being funded by the state uh, to um, cut uh, non cuttery employees by 30%, um, either by cutting salaries or laying off workers with too much notice. Saudi Arabia um, reduced, allowed employers to reduce salaries by up to 40% for six months. Companies could terminate the employee contracts after six months of the pandemic period. By contrast, Oman insisted that no wages should be reduced, nor any deductions made because the employment contract must be honored. And uh, whereas in the UAE, what, what they did was they allowed employers to change the contracts. They just amended the contracts to reduce the wages. Kuwait rejected a draft law uh, to reduce the salaries by up to 50% um, and allowed tenants to delay paying their rent. Bahrain, uh, Bahrain's government promised to pay from July 
50% of the salaries for hard hit private sector workers and to pay citizen salaries in the private sector and citizens electricity and water bills. So you can see a very mixed uh, response by the governments. So we need, to, we need to take into account what is lawful in the countries and what is not lawful with regard to actions uh, to be taken of, of, this, of wage reductions and wage cuts. Uh, can I just uh, for, do a very quick follow-up question with you? So it, doesn't this wage cut where it is uh, where it is applicable to non-nationals but not applicable to nationals kind of thing, doesn't this uh, somewhere go against the principle of non-discrimination? Is it a human rights violation? Would it come under that kind of uh, purview or is this something that is allowed and normal. Ray? Ray, did you get me? Uh, I, I didn't get, I, my connection is uh, not, not doing well. Uh, so I, I, I lost you. Yeah, can you, can you repeat? Can uh, you hear me? Yes, I can. I, I was saying this question of where wage cuts, uh, where nationals are exempted and it affects non-nationals. Isn't this against the principle of non-discrimination? Is, is this? But, yeah, in the Gulf states, that discrimination has always been there. I mean, there is a, there is a clear uh, separation between nationals and non-nationals on a whole range of issues. Uh, and always has been. That's what the kafala system uh, um, structured within the Gulf states. Um, but uh, with Qatar, um, we can talk about that later. Uh, you know, things are changing, and it's a new. There's a new deal. There's a so so called uh, abolition of the kafala, at least the ability for employees to change um, employers um, without permission of their employer. And without having to go back home. So that's going to develop a local labor market for the first time, which the kafala system has, has prevented. Okay, so that's going to be something that's interesting to, to observe and see what happens, uh, you know, particularly when the, when the pandemic um, has, has, uh, has lifted. Uh, but the discrimination, of course, is there and always has been. Okay, uh, I, I'll come back to you to uh, to uh, share about the, the kind of wage protection system. But before I do that, let me go to Francois, and um, and, and Francois, if, uh, if you can, you know, throw light on, and Ray hinted at this. But, uh, there are institutions even within the UN that do not want to call it wage theft. You know that. The, it's too strong a word kind of thing. And yet from what we have just heard uh, from, uh, from Ray and Ellen, from the examples that they have given, uh, even from what uh, Dilip had said, we can see that this problem is pre-existing COVID, exasperated in COVID and grown so much kind of thing. So is it not time in today's day and age kind of thing when we talk of UN guiding principles on business and human rights, we talk of visibility along supply chains and things like that, when we're talking about a lot of corporate accountability and things like that, isn't it time we start like what Ray is saying? call it for what it is, a, a criminal kind of thing, a wage theft it is, is stealing. And how did this become so big within migration governance uh, when we are talking about migration governance? Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And, and it's good to see uh, um, I'm going to cut my, my video uh, in order to ensure that the, the communication is good for the moment. Um, and and I, I'll try to answer your question. Um, the my focus is on the individual migrant, as you mentioned. I was the special rapporteur on the human rights of migrants, and that's my focus. The main issue is precarity of status of the migrant workers. That is the key to their to their plight. 
the imbalance of power between them and their employers. And that is true everywhere, not simply in Gulf states. That is true in Canada, that is true in, in America, that is true in Europe, that is true everywhere. The, the, stat, the, the precarity of status creates the fear of being returned home without having achieved the objectives of that migration journey, that migration project in which they have invested so much. They have invested family resources, they have gone into debt, they have uh, crossed oceans, they've, they've sweated, it was mentioned, the sweat on their brow, um, uh, and, and, uh, and they have responsibilities. They have to repay the loan sharks, they have to school the children. The people are waiting for them to do that. And this is a duty they have, which explains that in many cases, migrants will not try to contest or protest because that might bring them to the attention of the authorities. They prefer to move on. One big strategy of most migrant workers who are in a precarious situation, either undocumented or temporary migrant workers, is to move on. Try not to attract the attention of the authorities. And so, and so there's a fear, there's this, this fear of, of uh, deportation, which is a deterrent for fighting for your rights. Um, now, what is needed is not new. It's empowerment. This has been true for all marginalized groups over the centuries. You have to be empowered. You have to find this has been the fight of women, indigenous peoples, minorities, detainees, gays and lesbians. I mean, all the peoples who are minoritized, marginalized in their society, try to find ways of empowering themselves in order to establish a much more balanced dialogue with the, the powers that be. Uh, and we have to understand that today, the marginalization of migrant workers, be they undocumented or temporary migrant workers, uh, is engineered. We know very well that they exist. We know that they create wealth. And we do this because we want to extract the maximum labor output for the minimum labor cost. And this happens mostly in um, uh, economic sectors which are not delocalizable. You can't delocalize uh, hospitality. You can't delocalize agriculture. And so we have what, what we've done is delocalize uh, labor conditions from countries where labor costs are much lower to uh, the countries of destination. And to me, that is a, a key element. There hasn't been, you know, many answers over the centuries for that. But over the past century, the main answer Collective bargaining. That's how you establish a much more balanced relationship between workers and employers. Uh, we know that the union movement um, has been in ups and downs over the past decades, but this is this is the the element which in the 20th century has worked for migrants, for industrial workers in England to start with, but but then uh, across uh, across the planet. I'm very happy to see that uh, there are initiatives in countries of origin, in countries of destination, and that this has been mentioned in the calls that have been published by Migrant Forum uh, over the past few months. I'm, I'm very happy to see that the World Bank is pushing states in, ter in terms of just now, uh, how they have reacted. But all these are dependent on political will. The, there will not be a common answer to the precarity of migrants unless migrants find a voice, find that their considerable agency they have considerable agency. They make life-altering decisions every day, but they can't do it at the public stage. They have no political heft. They have no political voice in the countries of destination. And, and in many cases, the, the engineering of their precarity is such that they don't dare speak up for fear of being returned home empty-handed. And therefore, we need to change that balance of power. And I'm, I'm, 
I'm very happy that the Global Compact on Migration has provided answers, but I'm very sad to to have to to you know say that it, they will not be put in place for a long time. I mean, the the, the whole thrust of the Global Compact is about making mobility across borders. The word facilitation is used six times in the Global Compact. And so we need to facilitate that. We need to facilitate transition between statuses, which uh, Ray just said is happening maybe in certain countries changing their kafala system. We uh, must allow access to much better access to justice. Well, access to justice for many migrant workers is, you know, an illusion. They don't want to sing to you know to to identify themselves as contesting decisions for fear of being deported, or they don't have the money, they don't have the resources, they don't have the information, they don't know their rights, they are not counsel, there's no union to help them. So this is the kind of thing that is in the global compact, and the global compact is not an amnesty international document. It's a document that's been negotiated and adopted by states. So states know what to do but they don't do it. And it will take, I fear, quite a long time to make sure that the agency of all those migrant workers is actually, um, you know, put to good work to, to, to lack of political will. Uh, Thank, thanks, Francois, for that, and and I and thank thank you for uh, for for starting off by uh, for point uh, by pointing out the precarity of status, uh, the, uh, how, how deep that is, to the point that migrants will not even come forward to make complaints. This is something that we have taken time and time over again. We have brought up in different forums, kind of thing, uh, and it, it's strange how governments or policymakers continue to ask for evidence. It's so difficult to get this evidence because migrants themselves, because of that precarious situation that they are in, will not come forward to make complaints. So we've got to find other ways of that kind of visibility. Unfortunately, even what you're saying in terms of the agency, and we recognize that, and we know that at times they have, and we've seen that, uh, where, you know, even during this time of COVID, when there were strikes or in a number of in a number of countries, kind of thing. But th there is a long way to go before this kind of agency is supported by other social forces as well. And so that's why I will ask you, uh, in, in that sense, then, uh, when we when we talk about access to justice, and part of our call with this is uh, that, uh, you know, can the justice system in terms of access and provision be made more, for lack of better words, migrant friendly, so that all these kind of inhibitors that there are that are, exist that prevent migrants from coming is there a way of giving them a kind of helping hand to overcome some of this and exercise that agency through the, through these kind of complaint or systems or justice systems that exist in countries of destination um, the, the the answer is if there is political will to do that uh, yes, there, there are ways of doing this. For example, small claims courts where lawyers are prohibited so that you don't have to spend for a lawyer and where judges are trained to listen to people who are not lawyers and who are you know, not always explaining themselves well. And, and that is a mechanism that exists in, in, in several countries for small claims and, you know, Wages, wage claims can be quite small compared to, you know, other commercial uh, issues um, at individual level. So that is possible. What what is needed is political will to do that for migrant workers. We have to recognize that for politicians, migrant workers do not represent an electorate, and and their employers, unfortunately, are the part of the electorate of those politicians angering those those employers is not necessarily what politicians will do. And that is why we need to find ways to empower those migrants through other ways. And I think workers associations and unionization, and if we don't want to talk about unions, you know, it has to be associations, but 
we need to, to allow these uh, migrants to work collectively. They already have associations, often underground associations, that, that uh, in, in countries, for example, pressure from other countries, pressure from international organizations could help create that type of momentum where people are allowed to associate or even unionize and then present claims collectively. Um, it's going to be difficult because even in countries where unionization is, is easy, like my country, um, uh, Canada, uh, it's, it's difficult for migrant workers to do that. Um, if you think of the agricultural sector, they're not connected with one another. The distances between farms is such, and the distance between farms and cities where the labor inspectors are is difficult, you know, is, is difficult to, 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 makes it difficult for them to get the support they need. Uh, calling labor inspectors by many migrant workers because they fear that labor inspectors who have power will be connected to immigration enforcement, will be connected to uh, the, the labor department and that they might, you know, uh, identify themselves as troublemakers. And so we need to create a, a, a situation where there is trust, where migrants can trust a number of institutions to protect their rights. That is not the interest of employers, because this will mean that there will be pressure to normalize the work of migrants as compared to the work of citizens. And if we have a situation with migrant workers, either undocumented or temporary migrant workers, it's because we have engineered this, this striking difference between the way we treat migrant workers and the way we treat citizens. And that difference will be difficult to overcome uh, in, in, in time because many of these um, uh, economic sectors where the migrant workers are, are employed are sectors with quite thin profit margins. And therefore there will be a need if we, if we normalize migrant workers in terms Thanks. It will be a, a huge labor cost, increase of labor cost for migrant work for, for employers, and it means that the government will have to transition these sectors uh, towards, you know, uh, much higher labor costs and support them like it's been done in the steel industry or in the textile industry. And states are not ready to do that in favor of people who are not even voting for them. Thanks. Thanks, Ranswell. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, and um, yeah, political will. And when you look at political will, it might be of short supply in addressing this issue of wage theft uh, in this time of the pandemic. Unfortunately, as as many countries would claim that they have uh, uh, been affected uh, by by the pandemic uh, and it has affected their economies uh, but I, I but I, I I think it is time therefore from what you are saying for a, another kind of conversation on what we mean therefore by by triple win and migration governance and I think that might be part of the rethinking that is required also uh, or go de delving deeper into some of the kind of uh, frameworks that we have out there uh, and what they could mean in terms of addressing some of these issues, frameworks like the Global Compact. But uh, let me quickly, uh, and I'd like to give the uh, 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 floor also, the space also to one or, one or two questions from the floor. But before I do that, let me just come for a very quick round again with the panelists. And let me start with you, uh, Dilip. If you could quickly say something on the what Ellen said, because if if the justice thing is slow in getting reformed, if political will is slow in coming forward, is a solidarity fund, a humanitarian perspective, is that possible in terms of putting forward something or like Ellen said, something like the debt swap kind of thing, instead of paying a debts countries of origin could then swap that for the loss in remittances so we don't have to lose twice. Are these ideas that could be worked out uh, at, at the micro, at the international level? Uh, thanks, sir. Thanks, um, um, William. And um, I, I enjoyed listening to 
Ellen, and uh, uh, I, I, I was particularly struck by this point about the directive that Philippines issued to migrants that they must remit, uh, that, 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 and, and that the migrants didn't like that. That was, that was interesting. I have seen that sort of thing. I will comment on the major points, but I, I just wanted to make this point that I had seen similar um, efforts and in the past actually directives issued also by countries like um, Turkey and Mexico earlier in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, again, to shore up foreign exchange resources back home, I mean, in, in Turkey and in Mexico, there were directives that migrants, you know, guest workers and other migrants, they must actually remit home. And not only that, the money should be used for productive purposes. And in those days, agriculture was a big thing. So buying a tractor is okay, but you know, buying food, not okay. Uh, that does not work. I think that does not work. And uh, you know, in trying to make remittances productive, we shouldn't forget that these are personal flows and people have their own way of working. So that was an interesting point you brought up. And that has an interesting implication. We, we can talk separately because I would like to explore that a bit. I was struck, you know, the reason remittances were ignored as small change, uh, well, forever until recently, but um, definitely in the past was because in countries like Philippines, most of the remittances were classified and reported in the official balance of payments data as compensation of employees, not as workers' remittances. It's a technical point, but if you are just doing a quick thing on remittances, you would find that in, two, two, in like the year 2000, remittances to the Philippines were 120 million, million, not billion dollars only. Compensation of employees was $6 billion. And that had something to do with that directive perhaps, I think. Now, good news in the current crisis to encourage more remittances, countries are using fiscal incentives rather than directives, which are more uh, punishment in, in nature. So Pakistan's remittance initiative, Bangladesh tax incentive, these are incentives and they are, they seem to be working. They seem to be drawing in billions of dollars. Now, there is a question of round tripping that one has to avoid, uh, meaning that just to avoid, get the 2% tax benefit, it's possible that some companies, banks, people will classify other kinds of money being sent for trade purposes, philanthropy, for anything else, investment purposes, rent payments, as remittances as well, right? So those kind of things are there. Uh, one has to be careful about that. Now, coming to the point about solidarity fund, um, I am very uh, sympathetic to that idea. And uh, um, then the uh, debt swap, debt swaps are temporary, literally band-aids, right? But okay, you know, band-aids are very helpful. So yes, uh, debt swaps tend to be very short-term measures and if properly designed, they can also help mo mostly to kick the ball, kick the burden, uh, down the road. Down so the road. immediately you don't need to address, but down the road, uh, you can address it when you are in a better situation. So in that sense, it is good. Um, but solidarity funds are much more interesting. What is important to remember here is that, um, you know, who would fund it? Who would provide funding for this? And my sense is that uh, if you think about new funds and you want to uh, get it from the funding from the governments. Governments are going to face political opposition from their line ministries. Uh, so they will have difficulty addressing this. You cannot put a tax on remittances so that you would fund the solidarity fund. Uh, that, uh, that may not work because that will go against the principle of uh, reducing remittance costs and facilitating flows. Um, so perhaps philanthropy is one way and diaspora philanthropy could be another way, a uh, particular way that you reach out to the diaspora as migrants and sort of say, hey, we want to create the solidarity fund. And the government is then providing seed funding or some kind of foundational funding, the structure and all that. So we are now looking at public private partnership of that kind. And believe me, I wouldn't involve banks. I mean, you know, they will take more than you, you and they would take it in ways that you wouldn't even imagine they took it from you. I have seen that happen 
banks have tended to hijack agendas all the time, time and time again. So be careful in designing these programs. But the big thing is scale. And, you know, um, I am reminded because last week we had a call uh, about Friends of Forum meeting of the Global Forum on Migration and Development. And we were talking about partnerships and I have proposed in the partnership structure, uh, some of you know the background paper uh, benefited from input from everyone. It proposes a concessional financing facility for migration, similar to the idea of the global concessional financing facility for refugees. Uh, now, the comment, one of the comments I received, and it was on online chat, and, and that person has followed up three times with me. So represented from a, from a member state. They want to put a line highlighting a particular program, uh, bilateral migration program. Uh, they took four years to fund it. The total cost was $1.2 million. It was going to train 60 chefs. 30 will stay home, 30 will come to a country in Europe. $1.2 million to train, to bring what, 30 chefs. I mean, that's not even a Band-Aid. That's, that's like something to not even affect a pinprick when you have a huge gap. You're talking about billions of people. And there is that focus on 1.2 million. Uh, so is that what you have in mind, Solidarity Fund? Or are we talking about big? Because the needs are big. I heard that a million people, million migrants have gone back to Egypt. Anecdotal, no data, but I have, it is anecdotal. I have heard several hundred thousand migrants have returned to Philippines. I heard from officials that 450,000 migrant workers have gone back from the Gulf to Kerala state alone in India. Uh, we are looking at tens of millions of people who are going back now and, and wage theft affecting a whole lot of people. You know, there are 270 million international migrants, according to statistics, I think it's closer to 300 million. Then there are maybe a billion or 750, 800 million internal migrants. We are talking about billions of people. So what is needed is a global concessional financing facility, similar to the concessional financing facility for refugees, with billions of dollars of financing, not one billion, but billions. And how can we mobilize it? One interesting idea would be again, public-private partnership and partnership with diaspora through diaspora bonds. So I think what I'm saying is everything is good. Small is not bad. Small is also good, but to take it to scale, you need something bigger amb ambition. And here we can discuss possibilities without a concessional financing facility for migrants, host countries that host a lot of migrants, they will not want to spend their taxpayers' money on migrants. We know that and there is no way any, any head of state can actually survive after doing that. So they need concessional financing, either from multilateral sources or $1 that does $4 equivalent in terms of uh, impact through financial engineering, through concessionality, through uh, partnership with other donors, through debt swaps, uh, all those things have to be brought in. Long answer, but I think it's a very, very important idea. No, th and, and thank you for that. And, and, and I'm glad that you've raised up this. And I'm wondering if this, the, the, your point on, on scaling and this kind of concessional fund, I'm wondering if we can get a nomad paper on this to deliberate on this further kind of thing, you know? I, I think it requires a, a good discussion. And I, and I see the point that you are making. And, and it will be something, because even as you look at the chat box now, you can see that uh, people are saying that this is, this is not an issue that is limited to one or two regions of the world. This seems to be a global problem. We heard a, a Ray say about it in Australia. We've got people in the chat box saying it's happening in Africa. So it is, and that's why it makes sense to, to, to scale this up. And, and uh, let, let's continue to think about that because I think it, it would be both the bandage that Ellen is talking about for the immediate relief of workers who have come back with nothing 
and in the long term. And I think that might be somewhere the link that is needed to be credible when we talk about migration and development as well. It's like the it's it's that part that is missing and that's part in the chat box as well where people have picked that up let me come to you uh, william uh, just one quick point uh, uh, the background paper for uh, the round table 6 on partnerships for the gfmd the summit is next month i think it might have been posted already on the web or it would be posted soon and um, that has already developed uh, some ideas on the concessional financing facility, but it doesn't uh, take away from the need to think about funding arrangements and even the solidarity fund. Uh, I think one needs a very careful, rigorous uh, analytical piece uh, highlighting what could be the structure and what are the pitfalls that need to be avoided um, so that we can make a beginning. So your Thank point you. was taken. Thanks. Thank you. And for those who who, who, are, who are wondering what this is, please go to the GFMD website, the Global Forum on Migration and Development, and you should be able to locate that paper there. If not, you could always send us a mail and we'll, we'll try to locate or send you the paper. Let me come to you, Ellen, then, that as you are listening to, to some of this and as you're looking at workers who are coming back and being repatriated and, and, uh, and women, what are some of the proposal, pro proposals that uh, you you think your uh, CMA and other civil society organizations? You heard uh, you heard Francois talk about empowered migrants, and uh, what are uh, some of the other solutions that you all are looking at in terms of how to address this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think, of course, we we try to focus on the the wage theft issue and what uh, we are doing already about this. Uh, specifically, we try to assist in documenting the the cases of the the workers. But I think in the medium and the long term, uh, we are using or seizing this opportunity that is caused by the COVID nineteen pandemic to reflect precisely on what is really missing for the longest time uh, for our migrant workers. The lack of social protection is one, and that's why even if they want don't want to come back home at the end of the day because of this indefinite period of the COVID pandemic they are forced to return to the Philippines to the countries of origin so social protection and as Francois said social dialogue is quite crucial how do you collectively raise your voices. I heard, uh, for example, in some countries in the Gulf, of course, in the Gulf, um, many, many, many countries are not cease parties to 97, 87 and 98. And so trade union uh, organizing is, is prohibited even for, for local workers. But the point is, and you can file your complaint for your, for if you're a migrant worker, you can file your complaint. But if you are in several several people are involved you can complain but you're not supposed to do it collectively so that's that's how 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 uh, ridiculous the situation is so you know the the fear of uh, the workers coming together and collectively raising their voices which i think is is one of the foundations of why the ILO is around so i think uh with this uh uh Hashtag of the build back better. We should be more assertive and sure of where our footing is in terms of uh, guaranteeing protection to, to migrant workers. The other thing is uh, just on, again, just to go back to the wage theft issue. We, I think in, in Asia, we're not using the term, but I think in, in, in the US, this is like a common term that is used when you are not paid or when your wage is cut or when your wage is reduced and all those things. And it is a crime. But then this is, I think, most prevalent. The practice of, of, of wage step is more prevalent in the cases of migrant workers, precisely because of this cross-border nature, that once they are out of the countries of destination, then it becomes really difficult for them to get back uh, their, their, their dues. And so there should be a mechanism to, 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 to be able to, that we, so we do not allow this thing to, to happen. I mean, again, the, we've been saying in the presence of the GCM that part of the task is to change the narrative of migration. And the changing of the narrative of migration is to say that the workers are crossing the borders, not only because we do not have the jobs in the country, in the Philippines, but because they are needed in the countries of destination. 
they are the ones that have kept their activities, economic activities, um, continuing, I mean, uninterrupted. So, I mean, uh, why can't they be given the same, the same rights as all the other workers? When, when no one is taking on the job, the migrant workers are there. When, when they need a lot of migrant workers and they do not have enough of the local workers, the migrant workers come into the picture. And yet when it comes to all of these very fundamental rights that any worker should enjoy, they do not have it. So I uh, think uh, Franz was saying political will, we have to do our, our job, I think, in, in, in this regard. So what do we mean by changing the narrative? Changing the narrative is not doing a repeat of these things. So building back better should really be building back better and, and addressing the gaps and deficits in decent work for migrant workers. Thanks, thanks, Ellen, for that. And uh, definitely this is something that we will have to look at even as we uh, look at what, what uh, what hope is there for the millions who have returned? And I think that is still the question that has not been answered uh, uh, till now, uh, is for the millions who have returned. Businesses will get a bailout from governments. Uh, national workers will get a helping hand. Uh, but for all the millions who have returned, all the millions who are stranded, what, what is the hope for them kind of thing? I think this is something we'll have to still continue to deliberate on. Uh, 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 Ray, many countries have this wage protection system. So it should be very easy to find out which employers have not paid their workers for months and things like that. And the government can always put up that money up front, pay the work migrant workers, uh, and then collect it from the businesses later. Uh, it, wouldn't this be an immediate solution? Yes, uh, I'll, t uh, I'll take Francois's example and I'll turn off my video because I'm losing every now and then, I'm losing you. So, um, yes, uh, in Qatar, of course, that, that is operative. Um, uh, the, the, wage, the wage protection systems, I mean, I, my, the first time I did an analysis of the wage protection systems, it was just clear to me that um, they were not wage protection systems at all. It's a misnomer. Then, in fact, they were just wage notification systems uh, whereby the employer pays the wages into a bank account. And here's where the issue of all workers require to have a bank account in order to participate in the wage protection system. Um, now, not, not all, uh, you know, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, have registered with the wage protection system, but that's an ongoing campaign to bring everybody uh, in. But really, these systems were just uh, to show that a, a wage has been paid into a bank account that registers the date. Um, and that's pretty much all that was being uh, monitored by the um, wage, wage protection system uh, department. Uh, so um, I was asked to uh, do some research into this and we did a report, as you mentioned in your introduction, um, and uh, I was the, the lead author. So it was, a, uh, it was the ILO with the uh, labor ministry. Um, and the, the um, recommendations were, I'll just give you a few of them. Um, uh, so that the basic wage is to be paid in accordance with the employment contract, that the food allowances are paid in accordance with the employment contract, um, that the basic wage is the minimum wage that was not being monitored, uh, and now the minimum wage uh, has been increased, but that will not be um, that will not be enforced until March next year. Um, also um, from March will be a minimum food allowance. And all of these are going to be uh, monitored in the wage protection system. The, uh, a separate section for overtime is to be introduced and separately calculated with proper overtime rates. The deductions must be seen, uh, must be looked at as being lawful. 
that pay slips must be made compulsory. That's a, a vexed issue, but it's an important one in my view. And uh, domestic workers should be paid under the wage protection system. And uh, a separate, we did a separate uh, report uh, on for domestic workers offering a, a simpler mechanism for employers to, to access the wage protection system. So um, in, in Qatar, at least, um, they are working to improve this, to actually make it a protection system. It is not as if companies are not being um, uh, located uh, when they don't pay or don't pay on time. Question is, uh, and there's not a lot of transparency uh, in the, um, the penalties with regard to uh, um, non-compliant employers, but they are being picked up um, and they are being uh, punished. But again, it's a system where, where they don't want entire disruption to the economy and the production. Uh, and so they try to um, um, fix the problem, make sure that the workers get paid. And you're quite right, the uh, insurance uh, uh, support and insurance for workers support and insurance fund uh, is designed we don't know how operative that is uh, we believe i believe that some payments have been made but again that's not uh, public we don't know exactly how it's being used right now and particularly over the last year um, but uh, indeed workers can who, who are where, where there are settlements in the uh, dispute settlement committees that can be this fund can be drawn upon and then the fund itself uh, to be renewable will make recover from the employers now if the employers go bankrupt there's a whole range of different issues whether they can seize assets and so on um, is we don't I don't know all the details of how that's operating but that is um, potentially the wage protection system is a very um, can be a very powerful one if the government puts in enough resources uh, to monitor and to and to uh, introduce the penalties just if just a, a last word if i could about the um about uh, you know the recruitment process and the um, the worker pays uh, system that operates um, you know one of the things there is that as i've shown in in my publication, endlessly showing, uh, arguing in my publications that um, that what the workers pay and and, and Dilip, you raised the issue of the Bangladeshis, which is a, an example that I often give, um, is the kickback bribes to employers in the destination countries. When I did the research on this, there was not. Uh, in countries of origin, there was not one agent who didn't tell me about it uh, and just saying that, yes, we have to do this in order to stay afloat. Um, but what's not being factored in, is, in my view, is uh, how much money is actually leaving origin countries for these kickback bribery payments to the personnel of the employing companies, which I think is it, it, collectively uh, in the aggregate uh, has to be in the billions of dollars, right? Um, and that's not being seen as leaving those countries because it's often done quite surreptitiously. It's a black market, but everybody knows about it. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, but really not much is being done about it. Um, and uh, we just have to keep uh, pushing uh, this issue. Um, these are not fees. These are charges being made to workers um, and they're, 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 a lot of it is gratuitous. The workers do not know where their money is going, how it's being distributed. They don't get receipts for the money that they pay um, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a lot to be done and it's not just agents in the countries of origin. The whole uh, process Thanks. begins with the tendering of projects in the country of destination. And so it's a systemic process that, in my view, um, has a level of corruption that needs to be addressed. 
Thanks, Ray. Thanks for that. And we have gone over time by four minutes. I'll ask you for another five minutes, if you will indulge me, so that I can get uh, Francois and then the closing remarks. Uh, uh, Francois, if you can come in quickly at this stage then, and looking at all the solutions that are there, what is there from the uh, and from your own experience as UN Special Rapporteur? You have mentioned the GCM. What are the other kind of spaces in which we can uh, we can take uh, avenues that are open to us uh, and strategies that are open to us as well in bringing up this issue at the global level. You have mentioned uh, fair unions and organizing. Uh, what else? Yeah. Um, what well, one uh, actor uh, about? We've talked quite a lot about this actor, but we haven't. Uh, discussed how to engage them are employers themselves. Uh, I know that there are employers, for example, um, Western construction companies in the Gulf states, which have instituted um, audits along their whole value chain to check that migrant workers were, you know, properly protected and by not only by their own employees but by the employees of their subcontractors so there are examples of employers doing the right thing and i even uh, have heard that they've been able to demonstrate that this was actually increasing their productivity because the workers were producing better because they were better treated and they were more loyal to the firm I, I think we need to engage with employers and, and try to show them that the exploitation of, of workers um, has advantages for them in terms of, you know, their balance sheet at the end of the month, but also has long term implications for their profitability and their productivity. And I think that um, you know, employer associations, for example, at international level, at national level, may be interested in the issue of level playing field, of competition between them, and and try. We could try to engage with them to show them, and and to you know try to have them on board with the idea of a level playing field in the labor market, so that exploitation is eliminated as a tool, as a competitive advantage. Uh, may happen it has happened in several countries which are probably better regulated uh, but it's it's a long shot uh, in many countries but that I would say that's an actor that we need not neglect we need to engage with them at at many levels Thanks, thanks, Francois, for that. And indeed, and I see Neil Wilkins from the Institute of Business and Human Rights in this webinar as well. And I know he uh, and the Business and uh, uh, Human Rights Resource Center in the UK, they are they are quite involved in this campaign and in talking to businesses. So it is true that that is one of the actors that we will have to uh, work with as well. Look, I would really love this conversation to continue. And I know it's important that this conversation continues. Not now. This webinar has to come to an end. But I hope each one of you continues to have this conversation. Because while some of us do have the privilege of sitting at home and doing these conferences, let us remember these. this is for, and today conference is for that migrant worker who has returned from a country of destination, who has not been paid wages for months, and whose whole development trajectory and his family's or her family's development trajectory is on hold. And we don't know when they will recover. So let us remember that this conference called this webinar is dedicated for that cause. And I'd really like to see how each one of you makes that commitment to take, take this conversation on. It is important for those who are interested to follow this conversation, please go to the justiceforwagetheft.org website uh, and you will find a lot of information there. You can contribute information to it as well. I want to thank everybody who was in the chat box, uh, who, who's posted messages in the chat box. Uh, and, and there are some key messages. I would like to point out the message of Ambassador Hai Sam, who, said, who, who has said that this is an issue that needs to be taken up at the international level. And definitely it is important that while we do these webinars, it is important like uh, uh, Dilip, you have said that we have to think of the scale of what is involved here. The scale demands 
a response at the global level. It's not a country, one country, it's not two countries, it's countries all over kind of countries of origin and it's millions of workers. So the issue has to have that kind of a response as well. I'd like to thank all the panelists for doing a wonderful job in breaking it down, deconstructing the implications of non-payment of wages, wage theft, and the spectrum of how it happens for migrant workers. For those who have said this, this is only one of the issues of migrant workers face, that is true. There are so many dimensions to migrant workers' lives, which Francois has called the precarity of status, to the point that even when they are wronged, they are afraid to come forward. They are unable to come forward because they have to make a choice, come forward now and lose all possible future or accept what is the now in the hope that in the future I'll get a better job or a different job or might even get some compensation. So let us think of those migrant workers today as we uh, as we uh, uh, leave this webinar and I will invite uh, I invite Yemi. Yemi, I'm so sorry I can't pronounce your last name, but I, I would like you to come in here for the for the closing remarks and just to say that Yemi is the chief technical of focal point for foreign uh, a Commonwealth and uh, for the for foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of, of of the UK. Yemi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, for not being able to pronounce my son's name. I think I deserve some, some compensation. So I will send you an invoice for that. Uh, my son name is Oluwakuide, but I understand it's quite difficult for many people to pronounce. Thank you very much, William. And um, thanks to the Migrant Forum in Asia, the organizers of this webinar, uh, and all the participants and the panelists. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a very insightful discussion. Uh, there's a lot to learn. And uh, I actually had, had, had a lot to write now. I, I've learned a lot. And, uh, it's, and I think it's really really and truly timely. Uh, it surely throws up a lot of policy issues and challenges that migrants face, especially as relates to their wages and by extension remittances. And uh, for us, we think this is the essence of the call to action. And I'll just briefly like to remind us that cross-border remittances to low and middle income countries are still higher than FDIs and official development assistance, and that the socioeconomic effect of the current crisis is expected to be very devastating to local communities, uh, countries, countries of origins, and households. And uh, in particular, in, we are, in particular, we can also we also think about the in, in, impact on migrants and their family, impact on local economies and communities and remittance service providers. Uh, I hope really on the on the call, I hope really from from the call to action perspective is that this sort of conversation, uh, I would say constructive conversation actually continues. And as the panelists have said and as you have also said, these are things to to discuss at the international level and uh, we will welcome it's and it's something that fcdo will, will be very strong will will, will be uh it's something that fcdo will will be very much interested in picking up and and having discussions with at the international level especially at the g8 and g20 uh levels and that then i'll, I'll I hope really, all that hope is really that all the policy makers and regulators and uh, remittance service providers can continue to address issues of remittances as it relates to migrants, the families, local economies, and communities, and in line with the 2030 agenda for 2020, 2030 SDA. Uh, we are we're, we're very grateful for this, uh, for this webinar and we thank all the participants and uh, we wish you a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. The recording of this webinar will be made available in YouTube. Once again, thank you for everybody who has participated. And uh, let, let's keep the fire burning and let's keep the struggle going. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.